one material that's been elusive to me despite numerous attempts has been clear glass. In the past, I've documented five previous attempts at producing it, even going as far as to travel out west for extra ingredients and help from other YouTubers. Each attempt got me closer and closer, but still nothing completely clear that would work for optics. Over in the background, it only took me another 15 attempts to finally figure out the missing ingredients and techniques to finally pull this off. All it took was learning how to make soap, learning how to make toothpaste, and making one more journey out west to collect the compound I was initially only interested in as a laundry detergent. First, the secret ingredient I needed as a flux that made optically clear glass much more achievable, borax. This flux was completely off my radar, as borosilicate glass is known for its heat resistance and for melting at a higher temperature, so the idea of adding it to my glass mixture to lower the melting point didn't even cross my mind. But in the end, this compound ended up being crucial. So to collect it from its natural source, I took a trip to the borax capital of the world, Boron, California. I'm here at the borax mine in Boron. Behind me is where they harvest it. That's an old lake bed, I believe. It is incredibly windy here, if you can't tell. So they extract it out, bring it up, and then they sell it and use it at many industrial purposes. On the side here at the visitor center, they have a, of a pit of some of the leftovers They let some of the visitors come and help themselves. So that's what I'm gonna do. Because for some reason, they won't let me down there. So that's how I'm gonna get my borax. I'm gonna grab a bucket. All right, so now I should have a variety of different boron-containing elements. I'm gonna make a few different items from. Too big. A little too big. To learn a little bit more about this rock itself, while in boron, I visited the rock expert, David Ayer. Wake up next to a wonderful wife, drive a bunch of bitching cars, and I play with rocks. <laughs> Can you ask for a better job than that? We're in the town of Boron right now, and these are several different minerals that contain boron. Right? Yeah, these are these are borates, and these particular are sodium borates. Uh, this is borax, the native borax, uh, and it actually has sort of a wet feeling because it's 10 molecules of water. And when it dehydrates to being white, that most people recognize it being, that's actually the mineral tincalconite which is five molecules of water. This is also borax. If you were to break off that edge, and you can still see here that it is translucent, hmm. this is what they refer to as red ore. This actually has high amounts of arsenic in it. One of the other sodium borates is kernite, uh, named after Kern County, the county that we're in. It was first identified here in Boron. Kernite is now principally used for making boric acid. And this is actually what a kernite crystal looks like. These are pretty rare. So like when you buy a box of borax soap, is it basically this? Yeah, it'll be basically more of your pentahydrate than so much your decahydrate. Reason why boron compounds work good in soap products mm -hmm. is it does two things. It actually does lo lower the surface tension of the water, which means the water makes the clothes a little wetter because that surface tension is lower. And it also acts as a mild hydrogen peroxide or so. Yeah, you're actually getting a peroxide bleaching that took place from the borax. Is borax mostly used in laundry detergent? Oh no, that's actually a very small part. It's 10, 12% of the markets actually for, for laundry purposes. Uh, majority of it is industrial applications. Everything from computer chips to fiberglass. Boron compounds are actually used in everything from birth to death. You will find it in the glass in your house, the glass in your car. You'll actually find it in the fuel in your gas tank because boron compounds will control the microbes that occur in your fuel. It's in your clothes, other than just washing. The space shuttle tiles, those were borosilicate. They were great at heat dissipation. Okay. Yeah, even in your plasma screen TV and your yeah. cell phone, yep, boron wow. compounds. <laughs> the benefits of borosilicate glass is it can actually take exceptionally high temperatures. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are familiar with Pyrex or the Pyrex brand. Yeah. Um, 
If you have Pyrex dishes that was produced uh, during 1960s, 1970s, boron compounds that was used in that actually all came from Death Valley. So is there any reason why this area has so much boron compounds? Well, this location, that actually was, was a lake at one time that was spring fed from the north. Where the boron compounds came from to feed into that spring, yep, that would be a nice thing to know too, wouldn't it? This deposit is rather old. The bottom of the pit is around 35 million. Some people would call that old. Of course, okay. the business I'm in, that's actually not overly old. Yeah. We've been mining here since 1927. Hence the town Boron, named after symbol B, number five on the elemental chart. And we are the borax capital of the world, at least as of right now. <laughs> While borax should hopefully help me make clear glass, David also collects a specific variety of this boron compound that has an oddity of not being transparent, but instead by acting more like fiber optics. This is a boron compound also, and the mineral name is ulexite. It's a sodium calcium borate. As far as ulexite goes, ulexite occurs throughout the rest of the world. The optical grade, which is what this is, only occurs in boron. Okay, you're not looking through the rock it's projecting the image to the surface of the rock. This is, ulexite from boron is a natural occurring fiber optic mineral. Only here in boron do we have the optical grade variety of ulexite. Ulexite from boron is the material that Bell Telephone experimented with back in the late 50s for the fiber optics we have today. Many industries experimented with the ulexite for its fiber optic properties. NASA experimented with it. I supplied them with that material. So the reason it has that property is because of how the molecules crystallize? That sounds, that's a good question right there. <laughs> They cannot reproduce ulexite to do this. This is an anomaly. Borex company tried to regrow ulexite in the lab. They were able to regrow it, but they could not get it to have its crystal habit realign. They don't know why. Now back home with a supply of borax, let's go through why this compound is so important and why all of my previous attempts have failed. First off, let's lay out two unique challenges I faced sourcing all of the raw ingredients and heating it to the adequate melting temperature. A glass maker today will just use a premix powder for producing a clear and easy to work with glass. But with the unique rules that I attempt to follow in my series, I can't just buy the ingredients to make glass. I need to source them from nature, which is something that's become a bit of a lost art. So piecing together the best recipes and the sources of these ingredients and how to remove any impurities from them has always been a challenge. Then there's a the method of heating it. Forming glass requires some pretty intense heat. At a temperature range, they require some special and expensive equipment to reach it. A gas furnace in a glass blowing studio can cost anywhere from eight to 20 grand, if not more. Something a bit of a range for a YouTuber who only dabbles in glass making. For some of my first attempts, I was able to get access to one of these furnaces, which can reach temperatures up to 2300 degrees Fahrenheit. However, running these gas powered furnaces is pretty expensive and getting continued access to them quickly became pretty impossible. After that, I tried a series of different kiln setups, including a recreation of Grant's Forge. But without an easy way to regulate and control the temperature, these methods were not ideal for making glass. Then there's the issue that glass tends to require some really long bake times, and it's not too safe to leave something like that running with an open flame. Fortunately, it was around this time that our channel had picked up a little traction, and I could invest a little more money into some small electric kilns. And this is where I could really start narrowing down the science behind this. With the gas setup, it would take a long time to heat up and I'd have to basically babysit it so I didn't risk burning down the garage. But the kiln, I could reach high temperatures in as quick as 10 minutes and didn't need to be run outside under constant supervision. So I could do a lot of fairly quick tests. With all these kilns and forges, getting to that peak temperature of at least 2300 degrees Fahrenheit was a challenge. And these electric kilns still fall just a little short. This lower working temperature is where a large challenge comes in. And what leads to the next topic and where the borax becomes so crucial, the flux. A flux is any compound added to a glass mix that will lower the melting temperature and make it more malleable so it's possible to work with it. The first flux I tried to use is potassium carbonate or potash, which can be extracted from the ashes of hardwood trees. So after much work, I extracted the compound by soaking tons of ashes in water, draining and boiling off the final solution to yield a gray final compound. That however did not yield the best glass. So I tried again, and still no luck. 
potash can be used to make glass, but most often the preferred compound is sodium carbonate. So I figured I could source this and see if I have better luck. So I took a trip to the closest natural source of it to me, Wyoming. This seemed to work better, but it still was falling short. With the easy to use electric kilns, I ran multiple tests using both my naturally sourced compounds and chemically pure purchased ones and learned while the soda ash was able to get me a lot closer, completely clear, bubble-free glass wasn't possible with just these compounds, no matter how long I was able to bake it for. Only when I added the borax did things finally turn out clear. Looking at the melting points of potash, soda ash, and borax, you can start to see why. By using borax, the overall melting point of my glass mixture goes down even further, allowing it to turn more fluid at the slightly lower temperature and all the bubbles to more easily separate. So now, knowing a workable recipe for success, I just need to prepare all of my compounds and see if I can actually pull this off. So when I first tried to make glass, I thought you just needed sand, but it actually involves hundreds of different compounds. So next I learned about fluxes and other compounds like lime that help stabilize it. I kind of just threw in all the compounds without purifying them, and that ended up with pretty opaque results. The thing I learned is that in order to make clear glass, you first gotta learn how to make soap, you gotta learn how to make toothpaste, you gotta learn how to make laundry detergent. So in making those other items, I learned how to process these other compounds into their pure elements. And these come from all around the country. I got the sand and limestone from here in Minnesota. I got the soda ash from the lake in Wyoming. I got salt from a salt mine in Utah. Gypsum crystals are from Arizona. And the borax is from California. A little bit of all over from the US. And the sand, when I did the two-face, actually did a bunch extra. So I have some leftover silicon dioxide which is just like straight quartz, no impurities. You can tell there's a huge difference in color. So that right there itself is a pretty good sign. So with these six compounds, I can hopefully finally make clear glass. All right, so let's start purifying some chemicals. First, I took the limestone and baked it at over 1600 degrees Fahrenheit. Turning the calcium carbonate inside of it into calcium oxide which is water soluble and forms a very caustic calcium hydroxide. And we are very basic. Let's get some pumpkin spice lot. All the impurities in the stone should precipitate out as solids and can be strained out. I can then react my soda ash with the calcium hydroxide to form a dissolved lye. Some impurities from the soda ash should stay solid and can also be strained out. Now, both the calcium hydroxide and lye will slowly react with CO2 in the air and turn back into the calcium carbonate and soda ash that I'm after. To speed it up, I'll bubble a bit of CO2, which will reduce both of them to their less caustic version. The rest of the compounds I crushed and dissolved into water. Then strained them to remove any solid impurities and left them to dry. Once dried, I measured them out and combined them into a ball mill to evenly mix and pulverize them. Now to melt it into glass. Just let it run overnight. Hopefully have some clear glass. From here, it took several attempts, experimenting to find an ideal setup to pour it onto to form a nice puck. I don't think that was steel. That's aluminum. Yet still, there was one last major hurdle I had to overcome, annealing it. On its own glass will cool unevenly from the surface in which can cause tension to form within it and eventually cause it to shatter. <laughs> so to solve that, you have to slowly cool it over several hours and up to days. The exact rate depends on the thickness of your glass and its composition. Since I made my glass myself, this was a guessing game. An attempt after attempt, it kept cracking on me. The good news is I can throw the glass back into the crucible and remelt it again. And each time I did this, it seemed to get clearer with more and more bubbles removed until I finally had a very clear, solid piece to work with. Oh. 
Okay, took like 15 to 20 tries, but I finally have some clear glass. Well, actually it broke in half. Uh, where did I put that other piece? Rushed a little bit trying to flip it because it was starting to slump and ended up cracking in half, but both halves are actually clear glass. Took like 15 to 20 tries, but uh, finally have it. It's got slight discoloration, slight greenness to it. So there might be, still be some impurities or might be caused by the borax, I'm not sure, but this is definitely clear glass. I feel pretty confident I can actually make some lenses out of this. Finally got it. Now with both optical gray glass and a metal produced from scratch, I can move forward on my camera project, make a camera lens next. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe and check out other content we have covering a wide variety of topics. Also, if you've enjoyed these series, consider supporting us on Patreon. We are largely a fan-funded channel and depend on the support of our viewers in order to keep our series going. Thanks for watching.